Okay, so the first thing we need to talk about are the different versions of the mid-journey model. It started with v1, but we are currently, as of recording this, at the end of, uh, at the beginning of July 2023, version 5.2 was just released. So you can figure out what the current version is, the default, by going to or by using the slash settings command, and it will be selected in green. You can see we have a couple choices, one, two, three, four, five, and then 5.1 and 5.2. By the time you watch this, it's likely that there will be other versions here. And if there's anything significant, massive updates, of course, I'll redo the course or at least the important relevant videos. 5.2 was just released like five days ago. Before that, we had 5.1 as the default version. Before that, 5 was the default version, and so on. And uh, we have access to the previous versions, although I rarely use any of these. Sometimes I will switch to 5 deliberately, and rarely I'll switch to 3, because sometimes it's a little bit better at building interesting compositions. So I'll start with that, and then I'll feed my image back to a newer version like 5.2. But that's a much more advanced concept. What matters now is that we can see what the default version is. It should be already selected for you, the most recent, most likely, unless they decide to roll back for some reason to 5.1. The current default is 5.2. So let's go through a little journey in time. Here is the exact same prompt. Imagine a treehouse castle. I didn't say anything about the style, the colors, the composition, the lighting, nothing, just treehouse castle. Every mid-journey model has some basically pre-baked style preferences. Each model has its own bias or uh, tendencies towards a particular style based on how the model was trained. And with V1, you can see that our treehouse castle is not at all photo photorealistic. It's not very 3D even. It's kind of like collage looking, flat. The lighting is not very interesting or dynamic, but of course this is V1. So here's the same prompt run with V2 treehouse castle. The lighting is a bit more dynamic. Things look slightly more 3D, but not photographic at all. If we compare them, the resolution maybe is a little bit better, not quite as pixelated, but still not great. Then we move to V3, kind of in the same vein. It's better, but it's sort of pixel art looking by default. Um, it's more colorful, but not anywhere near the type of uh, output that we get today. Then we go to V4, which was a significant improvement, where things definitely, by default, look more realistic, more 3D, maybe a bit more photographic or 3D render-ish, less flat. Let's just leave it at that, compared to V1. And then V5 is the biggest difference, the biggest jump, in my opinion, because V5 was trained basically to favor uh, a more photographic style by default. And it actually is still the most um naturally photographic model version we can get really good photograph looking images with 5.2 but what's interesting is that v5 has a stronger tendency towards photographic looking images by default i didn't say i wanted to photograph i don't want a hyper realistic treehouse castle i just said treehouse castle v5 is the most photographic currently if we look at 5.1 which doesn't seem like much of a difference uh, in terms of model numbers. But if you look at the results, things are less photographic, more fantastical, more stylized, more over the top, more um, I, I sort of over the top lighting. It's prettier, but less photographic looking. These look like they could be real, in my opinion, or close to real. These look like something from a video game or something from a, uh, you know, a fancy, I don't know, Marvel movie or something maybe. But this doesn't mean that we can't use 5.1 or 5.2 to make really good looking photographic images. This is solely about the individual model versions baked in preferences towards one style or another. And that brings us to the most recent version in the current default as of right now in July 2023, version 5.2. So again, it's very stylized, beautiful, great lighting, dramatic, but it looks like something out of a video game, um, you know, or some sort of 3D render. It doesn't quite look real. It's over the top. It's stylized. We can turn that down. We can control that as we get better with our prompts. All that I did as a control here is imagine a treehouse castle, nothing else. Now let's go back to V1. Compare that difference. A treehouse castle in V1 to a treehouse castle in V5.2. Pretty significant difference. Okay, 
So that's just a quick rundown of the history of the models, a little progression of how much they've improved over time, and I'm sure they will continue to get much, much better. Now, if we go to Discord, remember that you can always check on the model version that you have currently selected by using slash settings, and then you can dismiss this if it bothers you to have it sticking around. So the default setting for me right now is using 5.2, and if I imagine something, let's do a field of tulips, at sunset, this will use version 5.2 because that's what I have selected in my settings. But I could switch that up if I go to slash settings. I can change that version. Maybe I want to use version 5. I'm going to rerun the same prompt. So slash imagine a field of tulips. Let me make sure I match the language exactly. No, field of tulips, comma, sunset. Okay, Field of Tulips, Sunset. This is now using version 5. Because I have version 5 selected in my settings, it will stay that way until I change it. Now, that's not the only way to change the version. This is just the, the way that you can continuously use the same version for all of your prompts, because now everything will be V5. Or if I selected V1, everything would be V1. But we can change the version number on a prompt by prompt basis using the dash dash version or dash dash v parameter. By the way, you can see that uh, this is our 5.2, the most recent version, where things, they look beautiful, but they're still, it almost looks like an illustration. Again, over the top, if you look at the tulips here, it's not really a photograph. It looks like something that's been drawn or painted or made in, you know, um, some sort of 3D tool. If we look at V5, which has a more photographic style by default, I'm not saying these look like perfect photographs, but it's more photographic than 5.2. But we can coach the model and tell it we want a photograph or that we want an over-the-top 3D render or that we want an anime or whatever we want, you know, a cartoon, an oil painting. We have full control over that. This is solely about what the model tends to prefer if you don't guide it otherwise. Okay. So back to the version parameter. Notice when I selected V5, or let's do V1. Let's go way back in time, and let's run the same prompt. So imagine, and then field of tulips, sunset. Notice what it adds to the end of my prompt. Dash, dash, V, and then a space, one. This prompt says I want a field of sun tulips at sunset using version one. So the parameter dash dash version, or for short dash dash V, which is what most people use, accepts a version number after it separated, separated by a space. So one, two, three, four, five, or 5.1 and 5.2. If you use this at any point, you can change the version used within a prompt. Um, and it won't impact future prompts. It's only for that one prompt. So if you look at my slides, that's exactly what I did. Imagine a treehouse castle, dash dash v5, using model version 5, dash dash v4, use version 4, and so on, dash dash v1. So you can do this if you want to try things with different versions, see how they look, without having to go to the settings command. But if you want to consistently use the same version for some reason, you only want to use 5, you can select it here, and that will now be the default. But I'm going to go back to 5.2, it's the latest version, and it tends to work best. This is taking a while, so I'll be back when that finishes. Uh, and actually, before that, I should mention the parameter syntax is that parameters always go at the very end of a prompt. We'll learn more about parameters, but they all start with dash dash something. So this means that you should not start your prompt with dash dash v1 and then your text, you know, a jello spaceship. Instead, it should always be your prompt text and at the very end, any parameters like dash dash v1. But again, there are many other parameters we'll learn. We'll talk about stylize, we'll talk about chaos, we'll talk about things like uh, the no parameter. Any of those parameters, they start with dash dash, they all go at the end of your prompt. The only one we've seen so far is version. And my V1 of the tulips finished up. I ran it twice because it was taking so long, uh, but this is what it looks like. So clearly a very big difference, right? <laughs> when I'm specifying the version one, it does not look good compared to what we got when we specified version five or 5.2 or 5.1. 5.2 is the default here.
Aside from the obvious uh, stylistic differences and quality differences between versions, there's also been improvements made to certain areas where Midjourney and a lot of uh, image models struggle, including, notoriously, the rendering of hands. Human hands have been a challenge for most image models, and Midjourney famously will add people or create people with four fingers, six fingers, seven fingers, three fingers, especially with older versions. V5 onwards is better. It's not perfect. You still will often end up with somebody who has too many or too few fingers, but more often you'll get someone who has the correct number of fingers. So let me just demonstrate this just as another difference between models. It's not, ju it's not just about the quality of the images, the photographic nature, the artistic you know, style. That, that is important, and those are definite changes between models, but there's also subtler things, like another one is teeth. And another one is how the models handle text. They all suck at rendering text, let's be clear. But uh, you have a bit more control over the text with more recent models. But the point is that there's more to the distinctions between versions than just what you see here. Uh, there's incremental improvements made. So let's do a prompt of two people shaking hands. And let's say a close-up of two people shaking hands and I'll specify a version. Let's start with three. I'll run this twice, and then I'll do four twice. So you see I've hit my limit of maximum number of concurrent jobs, and actually what's happening is that I have two jobs when I tried to do version one that got hung up for some reason. What I can do is cancel the job, and the way that you do it is a little odd, but you react with an X emoji and that will cancel the job, so it's now gone. Let's do that to this one as well. X, if you ever get one that it's stuck, now it's gone, and my other jobs begin. So I hit that Q limit faster than I should have because I had these other jobs that were just paused and broken for some reason. Anyway, um, these are now starting to come in. <laughs> you can see with V3 to this one. Yeah, this one already finished. I mean, the fingers are just a garbled mess. It looks like, I don't even know, like ground beef or something awful. Now I'll try the same prompt, and I'll run this a few times with V4. And it will be better, better quality at least, but we're going to have a bunch of weird fingers as well. So I'll run that twice. Now I have hit the Q again, the limit, because I still have some jobs that are being processed. But I'm not going to cancel those yet. So here's my first batch of V4 images coming in. We have somebody, it looks like they have two thumbs. Poss no, actually, I'm not sure what's happening here. This person looks like they have a thumb on their index finger. We have this person here with one, two, three, four, five fingers, and then a thumb that's hidden on the other side. Uh, so, you know, we're getting some weird stuff going on. Here's another example. Now we have a person with four fingers, one, two, three, and then a thumb, and a very weird looking thumb. And uh, same thing here, one, two, three, and a thumb. So four fingers, one, two, three, and a thumb. The point is, it's just not perfect at all at generating hands. Uh, here's you know another example where this person has one, two, three, four, five fingers and a thumb. So not great. Now, if we use the latest default version, which is currently 5.2, I'll run that maybe twice. Here's our first batch of 5.2 hands. This person has one, two, three, four, plus a thumb. One, two, three, four, plus a thumb, although this finger still looks kind of weird. This person has one, two, three, four, plus a thumb. One, two, three, four. It's much better. It's still not perfect. Um, let's see, does this, eh, that's the right amount of fingers, right? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, okay. So we're in good shape with most of these. They might look a little weird, like this finger is kind of weird, but we're generally getting the right number of fingers. Just a quick illustration of that, uh, a notorious issue that image models tend to have. Midjourney has improved in that between versions. So the version numbers, it's not just about how pretty something looks. There are more specific details, like how it handles teeth, how it handles uh, fingers and things like that that have improved over time. And then the final thing we did learn in this video, I just used it as an opportunity to show you how to cancel a job. If you react to a job that's currently in progress using an X emoji, it will cancel the job and remove it from the queue.
Next up, let's talk about what this group of buttons below each grid that we generate does. We have eight but well, nine buttons, but we have two sets of four buttons, U1, U2, U3, and U4, and then V1, V2, V3, and V4. In this video, we'll talk about the U buttons, this first row. U stands for upscale. So initially, with older models of mid-journey, uh, the grid images would be generated at a lower resolution. So if I do something with V4, like, uh, I don't know, let's imagine the happiest cat on the planet, and I'll use dash dash V4. With V4, the individual images in the grid were generated at a resolution of 512 by 512 pixels. And then we could select one of them that we wanted to work with and upscale it using these buttons here, U1, 2, 3, and 4. And by upscaling it, it would increase the resolution to be 1024 by 1024. Okay, so our cat just finished, our happiest cat in the world. And this is with V4, just as a reminder, where the resolution is lower. These are 512 by 512 images. And then I could pick one that I wanted to upscale, basically make it bigger, higher resolution. And then also isolate it so that I could download it individually. Right now, I can save this image, but it's a full grid of all four cats. I could save that to my downloads, but usually you want to isolate one image that you like so that you can use it. And to do that, we have to click one of the upscale buttons. So the numbering here goes from one in the top left, then to two, then three in the bottom left, and four over here. One, two, three, four. Let's say that I like this image the best here. It looks very happy. I want to upscale it so I get a bigger or higher resolution version. I will click U2, upscale image number two in the grid. This doesn't take very long usually, but it will uh, take some time because for V4 at least, there's work involved. It is truly upscaling the image. With the more recent versions, V5, 5.1, 5.2, the initial image grids are actually generated where each image is already a high resolution 1024 by 1024. So when we click one of those upscale buttons with V5.2, for example, all that it really does is isolate the image. It gives us the image on its own, but it doesn't actually upscale it. So now I see a couple of buttons down here. We'll talk more about these later, um, although these are V4 buttons, so we won't spend too much time on them. But now I can save this image locally by right-clicking, save, or, well, I'll do that, uh, I can click on this web button. And this takes me to the Midjourney website where I can see my image. I can then save it here if I want to. I can favorite it, so I have a whole list of favorited images where maybe we generate thousands over a couple of months and it's hard to go through and you know view all of them, but I can favor the ones that I like. So if I go back to my home here, you can see all of the new upscales that I've created. So these are upscales, as you can see right there. They're individual images. I can also look at all of the grids that I've generated. So here's all the handshakes that I did just a couple of, it was that last video. Here's the grid that generated my four happiest cats on the planet. Go to upscales, I only see the larger images that I upscaled myself by clicking an upscale button. Okay, so that's with V4. It does actually increase the resolution. You can see a little chart here that says version four, the initial grid images are 512 by 512, then upscaled, they are 1024 by 1024. But with version five and beyond, they start at 1024 in the first place, 1024 by 1024 pixels. So upscaling them does not actually increase the size. And it happens very quickly compared to what we just saw with V4 because there's no real work that's being done. It's basically just isolating an image. So let's do a V5.2, just the default right now. Let me just make sure I didn't leave my settings toggled from, yes, okay. Midjourney version 5.2. I will imagine this time, I don't know, how about the, what should we do? The happiest fish in the ocean. Okay, so this is using version 5.2. I'll be back when this finishes. Okay, so, well, I guess we're still at 93%, but almost done. And I have this grid of my four images generated with V5.2. I can then pick one and upscale it. Let's take this one just because it's more distinctive, the color, so we'll remember it. And that would be four, right? One, two, three, four. So this is position four in the grid. I'll click U4 to upscale it. And this should happen very quickly because it's not actually doing anything beyond isolating the pre-existing 1024 by 1024 image. Okay. Now, 
I have this image, I can save it, same deal, right click, save image, Discord will ask me where I want to save it, or I can click the web button, I can even favorite the image from within Discord, just click the website, it takes me to see the isolated image here on my disk or on my mid journey homepage. And then it should show up under my upscales tab where I see this one image that was upscaled. I can also see the prompt, of course. And then I can see all of my grids where none of these, well, very few of them have actually been upscaled. A lot of the time I'll generate a grid and I'm not happy with it. So why bother upscaling an image? There are more benefits to upscaling an image though, beyond simply isolating the image so that you can save it. In the next video, we'll learn more about generating variations. In order to generate variations on this image, I first have to isolate it by upscaling it. So whether you're using V4 or 5, there's some differences, and same would go for V1, 2, 3, and 4. There's some differences in how the upscaling process works, where with V5, the images are not actually resized. There's no true upscaling. They're simply isolated. But it's still important to do that because once it's isolated, we can zoom out of the image. We can generate uh, variations of different degrees of strength, and we can play around with this, a particular image once we have isolated it by upscaling. Okay, and just remember these buttons go from one, two on the top row, three, four on the bottom row, left to right. Okay, so we talked about the upscale buttons. They all start with a U, U1, U2, U3, U4 for upscale. One, two, three, four is the order of the images in the grid. But there are five other buttons. And the first one we'll talk about is this button right here. This is basically a re-roll button. Regenerate the entire grid with the same prompt. So I don't want to do the V4 again. Let's do my fish, the happiest fish in the ocean. This is with V5.2. If I click this regenerate button down here, you'll see the same exact prompt with the same parameters, the same version is just run again. And it will generate me four new images in a grid. So it's not using any particular image and making variations on that. It's just running the prompt again from scratch. And this is something that you'll do pretty frequently um, if you're unhappy with the results. Midjourney often involves re-rolling, re-rolling, seeing if some, something works. You'll get a lot of variations uh, between grids, especially as you increase some of the parameters that we'll learn soon, like chaos and stylize. And then maybe you'll update the prompt, change the prompt. But the first step often is just going with the same prompt and trying it a few times. It's rare that you'll get exactly what you want ever, but it's also quite rare to get anything close to what you want on your very first attempt with a given prompt. Okay, so I'll be back when this finishes. Okay, it's almost done, we're at 93%. And I can already tell that I like this bottom left one, this, I guess, I don't know what that is, piranha-esque looking thing with the sharp teeth. If that's really what I wanted, I easily could have just written a prompt that said green fish, red, orange eyes, sharp teeth, whatever. But I'm happy with how it surprised me. I like this variation in this grid. Well, it's not a variation. I like this image in the grid. So now let's talk about these four buttons down here. The V button stands for variation, and the numbering system works the same. One, two, three, and then four in the bottom right corner. I can generate variations off of one of these images, meaning it will generate me a new grid of four images. Let's go with this one here, it's the most distinctive. So that's number three, I'll click V3. And this will make variations for image number three using the same prompt, but it will start with this basically at it, as its starting point. And we should get images that are similar to this, but they're all gonna vary quite a bit. Um, and you'll see right here, it actually says variations strong in parentheses. There's another way that I'll show you shortly to make weaker or simpler variations that are not as strong. I'll be back when this finishes. Okay, our images are coming in and you can see that they're all different, right? They're not clones of that initial one, but they're all similar to it. And I could keep going, right? This is an iterative process. Maybe I like the the shape of this wave here and this, I guess they all have wide open mouths, but I like this one. So I wanna keep going in that direction. It doesn't have such an orange spine. So I could generate variations on this. That would be image number two, right? One, two, three, four. So I could click V, no. Where'd this come from? <laughs> That's an earlier job that just finished. Here we go, V2. And that would generate variations on this. But the other thing that I can do is first isolate an image using upscale. So let's pick, uh, I guess I'll do this one just because it's distinctive. So that would be image two, I'll upscale it. Remember, I'm using the default version right now of 5.2. So this is very quick because it's not actually redoing the image. It's not upscaling it. It's just isolating it. And now I have two buttons. 
very strong and very subtle. So this will get me a new grid of images based on this original image, either with a subtle variation or a strong variation on that image. So let's try both. I'll start with the subtle variation. And then I'll click very strong. And I'll be back, hopefully, when those finish. Okay, so here's our subtle variation. You can see already they look very similar to the original. Right, we still have kind of the same exact composition, the same expression, same colors. There's some slight differences. It looks like we have fish down here and only bubbles over here. Um, you know, the, the rays of light are a little bit different. The color of the eyes changed a little, so far at least. And here's our strong variations. Quite different in terms of composition so far. Okay, so this is the subtle. It finished up. And, whoa, this, something's going on with this eye over here. It's a little weird. Uh, but you can tell that these are pretty close to the original image that I upscaled first, and then I clicked very subtle. And then here's our strong variations. Still a lot in common with the original image, but the composition has changed. Uh, the expression has changed. I mean, the fish is now facing left to right in most of these, except for this one. Over here, in our subtle variations, it's facing right to left. And here we go. These are the stronger variations. So you have control. If you upscale first, you isolate that image. And this is specific to V5.2, I believe, and onwards. Uh, so not even V5, but just 5.2 and later. You now have these two buttons. Once you upscale, you can do a subtle variation or a strong variation. Either way, it's going to generate another grid, four separate images, and then you repeat the process. Maybe I really like this subtle one here that doesn't have those fish just the bubbles although this eye is freaking me out so maybe i like this the brown eyes or the orange color eyes so i could then isolate that one by upscaling it so i'd upscale four and then i could generate more subtle variations or strong variations okay but let me show you what happens if i use an earlier version so let's stick with our theme of the happiest animal let's do the happiest ostrich in the world and this time i'm going to stick with v5 which is still very new, but not as new as V5.2. So I just want to show you if you use earlier versions, we end up with something a little bit different once we upscale. All right, so the ostriches just finished up. Let's say that I like this one, this sort of comic close up. So I'm going to upscale that. That would be number four. One, two, three, four. This is with V5. Remember, I used dash dash V5 in my prompt. And now I see something a little different for the earlier versions of Mid Journey. The buttons change a bit. Now I see make variations, but I don't see a make variation strong and a make variations subtle. So just know that with 5.2, we have that new option to make subtle versus strong variations. With earlier versions, we can still make variations, but not exactly in the same way. We don't have as much flexibility. It's just going to make me variations, just one button for variations. You'll also see a different set of buttons if you use V4. I don't know if there's a reason really to use V4 these days, but you should know that the buttons and functionality differ a little bit once you have upscaled an image, depending on the actual uh, model number that you're using or the model version. At the end of the day, you can regenerate the entire grid with the exact same prompt using this button to re-roll it, or you can generate variations based on one of the existing images in the grid, and that will make four new images in a grid. Or you can upscale an image first, like we did here, where I upscaled this one. Once I upscale it with V5.2, I have two choices, strong variations and subtle variations. And then we have this set of buttons here that we'll cover in the next video. Next, we're gonna talk about these zoom out buttons at least these first two. Zoom out two times, zoom out zoom out 1.5 times. We're going to leave custom zoomed for later because it's a little more advanced. You can actually zoom out of an image and rewrite the prompt at the same time using custom zoom. So we will learn that, but I'm just going to start with these two because they're simpler. So by clicking a zoom out button, which is only available once we have upscaled an image, once we've upscaled it, we can zoom out of the image. What that will do is not actually increase the resolution or the size of the image, but will regenerate images that are zoomed out based on the initial composition and reveal more stuff that might be outside the bounds of this composition. So it is not increasing the size. Just don't have that misconception. It's not making the image bigger. It is simply changing the composition. So let's go with one of these ostriches. Um, I already upscaled this one. So let's zoom out from this. I have two choices, 1.5 times zoom or double zoom. Uh, let's do both. 
So I'll start with 1.5 times and then zoom out two times. And it, by the way, if you use custom zoom, you can change that number. You could do a 1.2 zoom, you could do a 1.8, but the maximum zoom currently is two times. All right, so we can see these are already starting and we have more of the image showing. This is 1.5 and this is our two times zoom down here. And you can already tell just from their little previews that this is zoomed out further, right? We see more of the ostrich, the full neck. We see more sky, more trees on the right and the left, more ground. This is kind of a, a simple one to zoom out of. It's just increasing the background. But if I did a more complex prompt, maybe a, I don't know, isometric, isometric cyberpunk cityscape at night, neon colors. I just want to have more stuff happening. You'll see that you can get some pretty interesting results. And then once we cover custom zoom, again, that's coming later, we can do some really interesting things where you can completely rechange the composition. I could frame this in a picture on a living room wall, and then I could take that living room wall and zoom out further and have that actually be on a, I don't know, uh, a computer display. <laughs> so we can do all sorts of fun things. Here's our uh, initial image, very tight. I think it's the strongest still. I think the composition's better. But then I zoom out. Here's our 1.5 times zoom out. And here is our double zoom. Okay. And I could keep going. If I upscale one of them, I could then select zoom on one of them and, and keep going. Let's take one of these images though, maybe this one here. So this is my isometric cyberpunk cityscape at night. I'll isolate this one. What number is that? One, two, three. So upscale three. And it should go quick. Now I'll zoom out double. And hopefully it completes more of this image. We see more cityscape, more buildings, maybe the road keeps going, who knows, but we should see more stuff. And then I can keep going. By the way, you can actually see the process here where there's the initial image kind of showing up as that square and then things around it are being painted in as the image is generated. All right, so here is my zoomed out image and it zooms way out as you can see. Uh, let's pick one of these to upscale, maybe this one, upscale one. And here we are, there's our zoomed out image. So this road was continued, the buildings were continued. This thing is brand new right here, this is all new. Let's zoom out one more time. I'll do double zoom again, just to get uh, the biggest increase. And watch again, I won't make you watch the whole process of generating it, but watch as we see the initial uh, image, the seed image start in the, in the middle of the composition. There it is, you can see the original image, and then a bunch of blank space that's slowly being generated around it. All right, that finished up. One thing I've noticed is that the uh, zoom grids sometimes look lower quality than the actual images are. It all looks kind of fuzzy and blurry, but if I isolate one of them, let's take four, so I'll upscale, upscale four, you'll see that it actually is pretty high quality. There we are. Okay, so let me do a comparison real quick. I'll throw all three of our zooms onto a slide. Okay, so here's the three different versions of this original image I upscaled. We zoomed out a bit, this road's extended, there's more buildings, and then I did it again. Right, and so this whole composition here is now contained somewhere in the middle of this image and we get a bunch of other stuff generated. So it just helps, I think, to see all three of them side by side. And I did the most extreme zoom, double, two times zoom, but remember we have the 1.5 times zoom button and the custom zoom button that we have yet to discuss. Oh, and one thing I forgot to mention that probably isn't that important for most of you, but if you try to use earlier versions of Midjourney, you won't have that zoom functionality. Here's my image from V4 happiest cat on the planet, V4 that I upscaled, no zoom buttons available. With our V5 and beyond images that I've upscaled, I have zoom out two, zoom out 1.5, and custom zoom. This is a new feature and generally just speaks to the differences between versions. Compare what happens with V5 even, for variations we have one button, as we've already learned. Compare that to V5.2 where we have two buttons, very strong and very subtle. All right, so you can't zoom out with earlier versions. Use five and beyond. The next parameter we'll look at is aspect ratio, which is dash dash aspect or dash dash AR. 
we can use this parameter to customize the aspect ratio of the generated image. So instead of a square, which is a one-to-one -one aspect ratio, we can generate you know, YouTube thumbnail size uh, or common sizes like a 5-4 ratio, 3-2, 4-5, 7-4. You can provide any aspect ratio that you would like. However, there are some limitations on earlier versions. Uh, so V4 and before were limited to a one by two to a two by one aspect ratio. For V5 and 5.1, you can use any ratio. However, according to the documentation, aspect ratios greater than two to one are experimental and may give you unpredictable results. So the way that we specify the aspect ratio after using dash dash AR or dash dash aspect is to uh, separate our two numbers with a colon, just like you would normally write out an aspect ratio. So let's try generating a rectangular about three by two image. And we still haven't really talked about prompting, so we're just going to go with a very simple prompt. We'll use the default version, of course, of V5 or 5.1. Let's generate a, I don't know, uh, vulture, desert, cactus, sun. <laughs> and then I'll do dash dash AR for aspect ratio. And let's do a, th do we want three to two or five? Yeah, let's do three to two or three by two. And then I'll be back when this finishes. All right, it's just about done, 93%. And you can see that we're getting rectangular images with a three to two aspect ratio. Here's a kind of annoying issue I sometimes run into when I generate images. Occasionally, they won't show up after the job is completed. As you can see here, the job is done, but I don't actually see the image. It was showing me the progress, you know, the 70, 80, 90%, I could see the blurry images, and then nothing shows up at the end of the day. What we can do is go to uh, your profile and go to the list of either all, or just look at the grids that you've generated in order. So this is my most recent here, this grid. This is what I should be seeing in Discord that I'm not. And I can click copy and then get the job ID and then there's a command that I can use in discord which is slash show and show expects me to provide a job ID this will then go get the it won't rerun that job it will just go and get the image from that job basically the four images that were already generated so if you ever run into that issue that's one way around it the image was in fact generated four images of course we see them on the on the website but discord wasn't showing them for some reason anyway <laughs> there's our aspect ratio uh let's try another aspect ratio just to prove that it works let's do something more extreme so i will do a imagine whoops slash imagine and let's do a jellyfish disco and I'll specify a R this time will be I don't know uh, last time we did three by two let's go the other direction let's do something kind of extreme two by five and we wait and there we are we've got our two by five very tall rectangles let's upscale one of them I like this one maybe down here so that's gonna be four I'll upscale it and then I could, you know, open it up in the browser, save it to my machine and use it or even import it into Photoshop and tweak it and do whatever I want. Um, so it's upscaling that and let's open it in the web. And here's our nice, very tall rectangle. So that's how you can change the aspect ratio. The next parameter that we'll cover is called style. And it's very simple. You either don't use it or you set it to style raw. Those are the only choices, the default style, which means no style parameter, or dash dash style raw. When we talk about the Niji, Niji or Niji model, which is basically a version of Midjourney that helps make anime images, uh, there are other options for the style parameter, but for the default Midjourney model, which is what we're working with for most of this course, we only have one choice. It's either not there or it's set to raw. So what exactly does it do? Well, every Midjourney model has a default, a default built-in aesthetic, basically its own style preferences. And when we leave off style raw, those style preferences have a stronger presence. When we set dash dash style to raw, like in this example, it will reduce the influence of that default aesthetic, of that inbuilt flavor to images that Midjourney models have. 
So generally, if I zoom in on this example, uh, the prompt is, do they show the prompt? Pastel fields of oxalis type of flower. This is the default Midjourney 5.2 style. It's kind of illustrated, fantasy, high, uh, lots of colors, dramatic lighting, not at all photographic, right? Um, just over the top, but it, it emphasizes things like beauty um, and it makes things aesthetically pleasing out of the box. With the same prompt, if we remove the style or using dash dash style raw, we get a very different result. Still pretty, right? But it's nowhere near as dramatic, as illustrated, as, um, you know, the lighting is more realistic. Things generally look more photographic. Of course, there's ways of tweaking this. If you want to make a photograph, you probably wouldn't just use the prompt, pastel fields of oxalis. You could say photograph of pastel fields of oxalis shot on Sony A7R, some, whatever, some camera. You can get very specific. And we have a whole couple of videos on generating photorealistic images. But this is just about the parameter style raw. This is a good illustration of the difference. So let me illustrate the difference very quickly. Let's do an imagine um, dog with sunglasses on park bench or something like that. This is using the default inbuilt baked in flavor aesthetic preferences that come with Midjourney 5.2. I'll do the same thing with style raw. And like all the parameters we're going to learn, the parameters go at the end of the prompt. So after the actual text prompt. And I'll be back when these finish up. Okay, so here's the first batch. This first grid that we got back was using the default styles. So not style raw. And they all look good. They all look um, pretty photographic, although pretty stylized too. Uh, the composition, the reflections, the lighting. I mean, this one, especially here, I mean, we're dealing with a dog that is sitting like a human, two pairs of sunglasses, by the way, and more over the top lighting. If we compare that to the raw version, these look more like something you would take at a dog park if you saw a dog wearing sunglasses. And that's a relatively subtle example. Let me show you uh, another one that I ran earlier. So here I used the prompt man reading a book on the park or on a park bench. And this is with the style set to its default. So I didn't mention style raw, very pretty images, but also very pretty dramatic lighting. Um, it tends to favor very handsome and beautiful people, attractive faces. Uh, and it, some of them have a sort of like video game feel or 3D render feel. Here's the same prompt with style raw, where things look a little bit less intense, uh, a little bit less aesthetically pleasing maybe, but also um, this could be a good thing, right? If we want to remove that default style. So let's try one more example. Imagine I'll do a very simple prompt, coral reef, that's it. And then coral reef with none of the default baked in styles. Okay, these are almost done. Here is the, uh, there we go. Here is the default version with the all the style, just normal, mid-journey style aesthetic applied. Beautiful, um, illustrated, fantasy, sort of over the top, everything, vivid colors, not at all photographic. When we remove that style preference, that uh, inbuilt style aesthetic with style raw, we get things that look more photographic, more bland, and clearly there's a big difference. And the prompt is so simple that it's better to illustrate these sort of parameters using a simple prompt. Sometimes it's harder to see much of a difference if you have a very specific prompt. So if I had said I wanted to photograph for both of them, I would probably end up with something that looked pretty photographic. But if I just give it a simple thing like Coral Reef, that's relying very heavily on the baked in style preferences that the model was trained on. So we see a night and day difference using style dash dash raw. And that's the only value that we can use. So we either leave the parameter off or we set style to raw. Okay, the next parameter we'll look at is called chaos or dash dash C for short. Either one works, dash dash chaos, dash dash C. Um, and chaos is kind of what it sounds like. It introduces more variation into the initial image grids, the higher the value for chaos. So the value goes from zero to 100 and the default is zero and that's important to note. So the default starts at zero, as you increase it, you can get more unexpected results, but less repeatable results. Lower chaos values have more reliable, repeatable results. Zero to 100 is the range of values. 
So let's just do uh, a couple of prompts. I'll have to fast forward once they finish, but let's do one. Um, I'm going to keep a simple prompt that could have lots of possible interpretations. How about banana newt? I love newts. Great animal. So I'll set chaos to zero, which is the default. And then I'll do another one where I set chaos maybe to 20, another where it's 40, and I'll go all the way up to 100, jumping by 20, and I'll be back when those finish. All right, well, I ended up running like 20 different examples just so I had more to show you. Because chaos is one of those things that uh, is not always obvious from one grid to the next, but if you run a bunch of stuff, you can start to tell a difference. So I ran this prompt, a sailboat rocket hybrid illustration with chaos of zero, the default. And all four of these are somewhat similar, right? It's a boat on an ocean. The amount of rocket varies for sure. And the illustration style is similar, at least with these three. This one's a bit more 3D renderish. These look like illustrations. Then I increase chaos to 20. And already we see a whole bunch of different types of images, right? We've got uh, like a profile 2D drawing and then we've got a different sort of drawing. And then we have two that look more three-dimensional. One's at sunset. I don't even know if rocket is involved in this one. This one is basically just a rocket ship. <laughs> and as I increase chaos more, things start to go off the rails even further. I don't know what's happening here. This is like a cellophane sailboat. <laughs> this one's just a regular sailboat illustration, like a 2D sort of tech company vector illustration. Here, we've got a rocket ship leaving space, beautiful, or sorry, leaving Earth's orbit or some planet's orbit. It's pretty, but no sailboat. And then here we've got what basically looks like a photo of a spaceship. So a ton of diversity in the results. Generally, <laughs> I keep chaos low, and there's a reason the default is zero. It will stick closer to your prompts. You'll get more similar results. But if you're exploring, if you're just playing around, you can increase chaos, and not even just playing around, but if you're not sure what you want, if you want to be surprised, you can use a slightly higher chaos uh, number. I wouldn't go up anything above, personally, like above 20 with five with model number 5.2. Uh, with V5 of Midjourney, chaos is a bit more sensitive in my experience than it used to be. So I keep it low if I want to increase it at all. Um, because you can see here with chaos of 50, uh, none of these really meet my prompt. I've got rocket ship, I've got uh, sailboat, and one of them is kind of an illustration. The others are, I don't even know what to call them. Um, so we just get a lot of crazy variation as you increase chaos. And it does go up to 100, but I'm not even going to show that with this example. Now, here's another example. Uh, I did jelly bean ice cream illustration, chaos of zero. Here's jelly bean ice cream illustration. They're all pretty similar illustration styles, composition. It's a cup that's clear, or a, I don't know what you would call, I guess a cup, a glass filled with ice cream and jelly beans on them. Then I increase chaos a bit more to 10. And now the style changes in some of them. The background color changes. It's still similar compositions, but this one is more like cartoony. This one's more 3D. This one is certainly more 3D rendery. I don't have the, the words to describe the styles. And then I go up to 50 and things vary a lot. And we've got a bowl of really weird looking jelly beans. Uh, we've got a cone and uh, then we've got I mean, I guess those are jelly beans. It almost looks like pills in there. This is more of an illustration. So as we increase chaos, we just get more unexpected results. Here's another example. Uh, I did the prompt of banana newt. That's the one you saw me run. Chaos of zero. Most of them are pretty similar. It's a yellow newt <laughs> looking straight on, pretty much centered at the, the quote unquote camera that doesn't actually exist. And then as I increase chaos, this is chaos of 20. Things vary even further, different compositions, different styles. This is a very different style from this, right? This is like a, a macro photography shot. Um, is that what you would call it? A tilt shift? Photo? I don't know what the right term is, but a very, you know, uh, blurred background. Um, and then we have these two that are kind of digital art looking. And then this one just looks like a photograph. And there's a hand in there for some reason. And then as I increase it even further... <laughs> I don't even know what we're looking at here with a chaos value of 80. I mean, what happened here? This is like a, a dog covered in yellow cotton candy fur or lamb's wool. And then I don't know what this is either. A really weird looking set of two fingers holding 
some yellow thing. <laughs> um, so as you increase that chaos, things just get, well, chaotic. And this was with a chaos value of 80, which is way higher than I would really recommend going, unless you're just trying to have a good time and play around. Now, here is an example of how I might actually use chaos. I gave it the prompt of pineapple heron hybrid. I just kept for go going for fruit plus animal hybrid, chaos of zero. And all four of these are very similar. Same composition, same concept, same artistic style, basically a, a pretty heron. I've got a nest of herons, like 50 heron nests in my backyard, and they're very noisy and very cool birds, which is, I guess, why they were on my mind. So we've got four of them looking the same direction from right to left, um, same sort of crest of feathers, the same, I mean, I guess this one has more pineapple in here. <laughs> you can see like the actual part of the pineapple right there. That's with chaos of zero. Now, if I increment it a tiny bit to 10, we get pretty drastic results where one of them is kind of the same composition, but the other three are very different, right? One is a much wider shot, one, and then two of these are almost straight on. And the colors are different, the styles are still the same, but I'm getting more variation. Remember though, this is me only running at one time each. So it's not proof that, you know, chaos of 10 is always gonna give you tons of different composition options, but it does show with all of the other examples I've, I've tried to provide in this video, um, that the higher you make chaos, the crazier your results get, the, the more they deviate from your prompt, especially once you go above something around 20, I would say, even above 10, you can get some weird results. So if you do wanna tweak chaos, you wanna be surprised, you want some, chaos introduced into your images, start small, even like five as a good starting point. The default is zero and it's quite sensitive. In model version 5.x, let's say 5.1 and 2, so far at least, are quite sensitive to chaos compared to earlier versions of mid-journey. So that's chaos, not one I use all the time, but sometimes. The next parameter that we'll cover is a little bit confusing because it's called stylize and we just learned about style. And they both control how much of Midjourney's uh, artistic sort of preferences are exerted on the images that it generates. But the way that we use stylize is quite a bit different. We actually provide a number between zero and 1000. If we provide zero, we're basically telling Midjourney and the model to, to closely match our prompt and not be as artistic or as stylized. If we provide something like a thousand, that's a maximum value for stylization. And we'll have more creative images, more artistic, but they might deviate from the prompt. So the example they use here, I'll zoom in a bit, is of the prompt, colorful risograph of a fig. A risograph is a, a printing, I think it's a screen printing technique. And with stylized set to zero here, you can see that it looks like uh, sort of a 1970s thing, I believe is what a risograph is. It looks like a screen print, right? Blocky colors, um, very bright colors, not at all realistic. And then as we increase stylize, things start to become a little bit more artistic, all the way up to a stylized value of 750 here, where it doesn't look like a risograph at all. It's kind of ignored the prompt. It's using the the subject of the prompt, it's getting the colorful part, it's getting the uh, the figs part, but the risograph part, I don't know why this won't open for me, come on, here we are, uh, it doesn't really look like a risograph at all. There are three-dimensional drawings, I guess, or paintings, um, they're very pretty, but they're not exactly what the prompt asked for. Now the default value for stylize is set to 100, so that's everything we've done so far, is had a stylized value of 100, which is pretty low but you can go all the way down to zero. You can increase it, and there's two ways of doing it. You can use the stylize parameter, dash dash stylize, or dash dash s. The other option is to use the settings command, which I'll just show you here. Run this command, and we have four choices for stylize, and this just sets our preference and whatever our preference is will be used on all of our prompts. Just like when I change the version, that changes the version from that point on out. So it's not a one-time thing. If you only wanna change the stylized value once for one prompt, use the parameter. If you wanna always have a very high level of stylization, which I don't necessarily recommend, you'll see that it's now going to set dash dash S to be 750 on all of my prompts. So I'll keep it at the default, that's where I like to leave it. There's a reason it's the default value. It's a little bit of artistic style added in, but it's very close to your initial prompt. It follows your prompt as well as it can. 
But if you want to change that, you can. And they explain what the different values are right here. So 50 is equal to style low. 100, which is the default, is the same as setting style to medium in your settings. If you set style to high, it will have a value of 250. And if you set style to very high, it will have a value of 750. Okay, so let me demonstrate this. I'm going to use uh, a particular artistic style called a lino cut, which I think is short for linoleum cut. It's a carving. You take a piece of linoleum, you carve into it an image like this. I had to do it in middle school. I cut myself very bad. I still have a scar from it, actually. <laughs> and uh, once you've carved that out, you then uh, roll ink over the, the piece of linoleum, and then you make a print. So we get sort of chunky, blocky strokes. Um, it's an ink print. And I want to try and, and have Mid Journey create something in this style for me. And you can do colored ones too. It just requires different layers of ink. So you can make something like that. So this is the aesthetic I'm going for. So I'm going to go through all the different, not every value, but I'll jump through maybe by 200, uh, the different options for stylized. So I'm going to go with a lino cut print of maybe uh, the California California coastal scene. Okay, so lino cut print of a California coastal scene, and then I'll set stylize. More often, I'll just use dash dash s. It's an alias, the exact same thing. I'll set it to be zero in my first one. And I'll try another one where I set it to 100. And then I'll just go up from there. I'll jump to maybe 300. And I'll be back when these are done. I'll go up to 500 and 700. And I'll have a whole set of examples to show you. Okay, so these finished up. And here is my first one, a lino cut print of a California coastal scene, stylized set to zero. And it is very close to my prompt, right? It's definitely a lino cut. It looks like a lino cut, at least. The aesthetic is there. And it's a California coastal scene. But I'm more worried about the artistic style. Then we go to 100, which is the default. And it still has the lino cut aesthetic where things are blocky. There's lots of patches of black um, and lots of lines and, and carving lines. Looks like an ink print, but it's certainly more artistic and less of a lino cut. This is a traditional lino cut, one or two colors, much blockier. This is further away from that. Then we get to 300 where there's still some elements of a lino cut. We have the lines that you can see in certain areas. We have the dark blacks, the black ink. And then we keep going to 500 where now, I mean, this would be really very insane if anybody could make this as a lino cut, as a, any sort of block print. There's so many colors, so many textures and things going on. Uh, it's pretty. Then we get to 700. Again, getting further and further away from the initial prompt. More artistic, more stylized, less close to the prompt. The subject is the same. It's still a California coastal scene, but the lino cut part is different. And then here's 900 finally, where uh, there's still a little taste of the lino cut in some of them, but it's it's way more of just an illustration, a digital thing, a painting, a drawing, who knows. Um, but you can see that the artistic style from Mid Journey has a much stronger presence as I increase that stylized value. Okay, I upscaled three and isolated them just so we could see the distinction closer. So here's one from the stylized where the, the value was set to zero, very much a lino cut. Here's stylized of 100, still looks like a lino cut, more colorful, more artistic, prettier, but still, I mean, even this is very hard to make using the lino cut technique, even though I'm not really an artist at all. And then here's stylized of 700, where you probably wouldn't even be able to tell that lino cut was originally in the prompt. Beautiful, really nice scene, but way more artistically uh, controlled by Mid Journey. Here's one more example of stylized I've just already run. Um, I did a longer, much more specific prompt. Acrylic painting of woman's face, bold brush strokes in the style of Basquiat, Neo-Expressionism. And this is with stylized dash dash S set to zero. Very close to what I was looking for, very similar to the prompt. Definitely an abstract painting, Neo-Expressionist, bold brush strokes, looks good. I increase the value for stylized to 100. And it still looks pretty good. It's more artistic. Um, I might, I think some of these look even a little bit better. Although something like this starts to look a bit more pop arty. Again, I'm not an art critic or anything, but it definitely more, uh, it's leaning away from the prompt a little bit. Then let's go to 500. They ran out of order, unfortunately, but here's 500 
where things still have some of the bold brush strokes, some of those qualities, but a lot more artistic and it's not hewing close to the prompt at all. And certainly when we go all the way up to something like 1000, that's only amplified further. So it's not like it ditches the prompt completely. We still have bold brush strokes, some neo-expressionist stuff going on. But this now looks something like a, a modern day, you know, something someone would do on a computer, a digital painting, nice, but different from the prompt. So it's not always a bad thing, of course, to increase stylized. Just know that uh, it does make a big difference. And if you lower that value to something like zero or 50, it will stick closer to the prompt. One other thing to know is that uh, Midjourney 5.2 specifically pays a lot more attention to stylize from earlier versions of Midjourney, like five, even 5.1. 5.1 or 5, you would have to do some pretty high values for stylize to see a difference, like 80% higher than you now need to do um, if you're using 5.2. So there's a pretty clear difference here, whether we're talking about a lino cut or something like a painting with a much more specific prompt, it kind of follows the prompt, but it does a lot more of its own thing here with a high value for stylize or for S. With a low value like zero, it sticks very closely to the prompt. Next, we'll take a look at the no parameter. It's called no, there's no shortcut for it, dash dash no. And it accepts a list of words, one or more words separated by commas, uh, that are basically things we don't want the image to include. So the example that they give is a still life, uh, is it gauche, gouache painting? It's a type of paint, I think, a watercolor type paint. Uh, and then they do the same prompt with dash dash no fruit. And we get less fruit. It's not a guarantee, though, that we won't get any fruit, right? There's still fruit up here. So that's important to note, like a lot of things in mid-journey, uh, there's no hard rules. <laughs> the model still just kind of does what it wants sometimes. Um, but you can at least steer it using dash dash no fruit and there's a couple options without fruit and then you could upscale one of those and generate variations. So it is not a guarantee that it will remove the things that uh, you're telling it to remove. So let's try an example. Let's have it generate busy city block and let's call let's do a cyberpunk, I don't know, isometric image. So I'm assuming I ran this a few times and it will usually generate one that has some people in it or some vehicles in it. And then we can go in and say, actually, we want that same type of prompt, but with no people or with no cars or no planes or whatever it does for us. So I'll be back when this finishes. Okay, this is what I got. Um, it might be small and difficult to see, but there are... Oh yeah, I'm all the way zoomed in. There's cars all over the place in these images. So let's try the same prompt with dash dash no cars. And then we can all add comma people. Although it's really hard to see the people in those images. And I'll be back when this finishes. Okay, this is what we get. Now, there's still cars in this image. As we talked about, it's not a guarantee that it will exclude cars completely. But this one has no cars. This one has no cars. This one, I can't see close enough. Yep, it has no cars either. This one does have cars. So it does make a difference. Same thing with people. Uh, I can't see any people in these images up here. Uh, I, were there even people? Yeah, there's people in this one. Um, so, you know, it's just a quick example. Let me do one more. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, I asked it to generate Cabin Lake Mountains. Very simple prompt. And here we are, we get some nice images of cabins on the lake with mountains and lots of trees. So I reran the prompt, but I added dash dash no trees. And now we get three of the four that have, f well, fewer trees. There's still trees here, there's still trees there, but they're not the focus of the image. This one has no trees. Uh, it made a pretty significant difference compared to these where the trees are very prominent. It makes sense. There's a lot of trees by lakes in the mountains. So uh, just a simple example there. One thing I want to call your attention to is that Midjourney really sucks at understanding the relationship between words and actual language. So it doesn't work well to say still life painting, don't add fruit, because it doesn't really interpret the relationship here between don't add and fruit. It just sees the word fruit, and that actually makes it more likely to include fruit. Same thing if I had said don't add trees. So instead of trying to go through the English language and writing a prompt that says no trees please or don't include trees, that sort of thing, instead what you want to do is use the dash dash no parameter and explicitly tell it no trees. 
That way, it doesn't matter that it doesn't understand the relationship between don't and don't include or don't add or ignore trees. You just tell it exactly using the programmatic interface, no trees. And remember, you can only use this once, but you can chain together a list using commas if I wanted to say no trees, no clouds, no snow, for example. Okay, so that's the no parameter. Here's a fun parameter. This is the tile parameter. I don't use it often, but uh, I actually use it when I'm generating slides or YouTube thumbnails sometimes. If I need to make a perfectly repeating pattern, we can use the dash dash tile parameter. There's no value that we provide to it. It's simply dash dash tile. And it tells the model to generate a repeating image that can be tiled. So in this case, a scribble of moss on rocks or watercolor koi dash dash tile makes it so that the image can repeat. So let me demonstrate this. So here's an example. Um, I just ran the prompt dark floral watercolor without tile. It, make, it makes me some nice dark florals that are watercolors, but they don't repeat well. When I add dash dash tile, it gives me four options. Let's pick one of them. Um, maybe should we do this one here perhaps? Yeah, let's do this one right here. So the top left, I'll upscale that one. And I'll go to the web. I'll save the image. And I'll just show you that it tiles nicely. Come on. And here we go. Something that's a little weird about the uh, tiled images when you upscale them is that they will render in the browser as uh, already being tiled, right? There's four of them. Is it four? No, maybe it's more than four, but it, it renders a bunch of them. This is the original image that we upscaled. And then this is what it's showing me in the browser once I've upscaled it. But then when I download it, <laughs> this is the extra confusing part. This is what I actually end up with. So it doesn't create a tiled image that's already repeated. It renders that for us so you can see the tiling in action. But when you download it, it's still just the original image. And so then, you know, now I could come in here and duplicate this a bunch of times and just do that. Whoops. A few more times. I'm just using Canva here. And you can see it does in fact work and it does tile nicely. And then I could fill the whole background with that. There we are, I've made a nice tiling wallpaper pattern. Maybe I could even send it off to be printed from one of those custom wallpaper places. It could look nice on a wall. Uh, so that's the dash dash tile parameter. Like I said, I don't use it all that much, but if I need some repeating pattern, you're not gonna have any luck unless you use dash dash tile. Otherwise, it just doesn't understand language enough and it, it, it might make something repeat, but it's certainly not gonna make it line up nicely and actually tile on a page.